Good morning. Welcome to Worship at Grace Lutheran Church. My name is Landon Martin. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to welcome you to God's house as we start a new week in the Lord's name and with his blessing. Uh, Serving alongside me today is uh, our own Deacon Dan, uh, Wayne, one of our elders, and as always, Becky on the organ. A couple of quick announcements. There is an additional flyer in your bulletin that has to do with our All Saints Remembrance. And so Um, If you would like to include someone uh, that uh, we've lost to paradise and eternity in the last year in that service in a a couple of weeks, uh, please fill that out, turn it into the church office. Um, We'd really appreciate that. Um, Another announcement, following today's service, we have uh, a potluck lunch along with uh, one of our fall voters assemblies that is most notably going to be presenting Uh, construction update, uh, the budget for 2023. Uh, I'll have a more comprehensive uh, overlook at how the church is doing in different ways. And so uh, if you are uh, at all curious what what God is doing in this place and what our um, focuses and emphases are are going to be missionally in the next year, that's a great opportunity. Um, And if that doesn't sound interesting, there's food. So it'll be a a great opportunity. to uh, kind of take ownership in this place that God has given to us. Um, Today's theme, uh, we take this gospel lesson where we have a widow and we have a judge, and we see the judge acting in an unjust way. And we use that as uh, a figure for how God does and doesn't uh, relate to us, judge us, stand by us, care for us, and, and all of these things. And ultimately, when uh, all the details are, are withered away. What's left is you and Jesus, and, and God seeing you through the lens of his sacrifice and, uh, and loving you every day. And so uh, that's going to be kind of this triumphant theme that we'll have before us uh, throughout our service today. And with that, I invite you to stand as we open that service with our hymn of invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Please kneel or be seated for a time of confession together. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand to share the peace and joy of that forgiveness with one another. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord Almighty, everlasting God, you have commanded us to pray and have promised to hear us. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may direct and govern our hearts in all things that we may preserve with steadfast faith in the confession of your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost is from Genesis chapter 32. The same night, Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Tabak. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed them. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen the God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is, for this, is from 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4. As for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is judged the living and the dead, and by his appearing of the kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with a complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, also be sober-minded, enduring suffering, doing the work of the evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Jesus told them a parable. To effect, they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but after he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continually coming. And the Lord said, Hear what this unrighteous judge says. 
And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find, the, find faith on earth? This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning, Cameron. This morning, I want to start off by talking about things that we quit. So I'll go first. When I was, I think, seven, I quit Little League because I didn't want to stand out in the sun all the time. <laughs> it just seemed very slow and boring and hot and bright, and so I quit. Do you think I made a good decision? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> What's something that you quit, Cameron? I quit a video game after I was playing it. Okay. Why did you quit that video game? Because I had nothing to do. You were bored with it? Yeah. Okay. All right. I think that's a pretty good decision. Do you think anyone else here has ever quit something? Lots let's, of times. Okay. Let's find out. Who has quit something that they're willing to share? Right there. I quit family... I, I quit the quizzes because I didn't know anything. <laughs> Do you mean right before this, the yeah. Bible trivia? I, well, you come to Bible class a lot, so you'll, you'll brush up real quick, I know. Yeah. All right, who else? Go ahead, yeah. I quit my, lo I quit my doll, Lava Bella. She's creepy. You quit what? I quit playing with her. I quit playing with her because she's, she's broken and she's creepy. You quit playing with your doll? Like a toy doll? Yeah. Okay, because she's creepy. That's a great decision, Katiana. Mm -hmm. Very good. Oh, yeah. Who else? There? I quit piano lessons because I didn't like practicing. There, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. We love to quit things that are hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or tedious. I, qu I quit playing golf because I'm terrible. <laughs> Me too! <laughs> Okay. You want to go back to Brayden? I quit being bad at reading. Oh. You quit being bad at reading. I like that. Um, how did you do that? How did you do that? Brayden, how did you do it? By getting good at it. Good job, man. How did you get good at it? Good job. I'm very happy for you. I think that's wonderful. All right. Has anyone else quit anything they're willing to share? Cameron, come up here. Mr. Love right here. <laughs> I'm excited about this. <laughs> How about that? I, I quit my master's degree program and went, to work, went back to work for the Air Force. Was that a good decision? Well, after, after 12 plus years getting my bachelor's degree <laughs> and, and nine quarter hours of my master's degree, they said, we're not going to do any more. Oh, they quit program. on you? They, they quit on me. Oh. And they wanted me to change my master. Oh. So I said, no way. I went Fair enough. The, I went back to the work for the Air Force for another 20 years. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. You want right there? When I was five, I quit soccer because Little League, I got candy after, and soccer, I got orange slices. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I quit smoking years ago. I'm glad of it. <laughs> Good job, Lane. You want to get Mr. Potter right there? I also quit smoking. My brother taught me how to do that. He picked me up by the neck, <laughs> pounded me against the wall a couple times, and said, don't smoke. This is a fun children's message today. Oh, boy. Um, I'm going to get Mr. Antio, and then I'll go to the eye in the sky. I quit smoking in the year 2000, and I went to a symposium, a, when a hypnotist. I walked out of there, and I never wanted another cigarette. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eye in the sky? I quit teaching. Okay. Well, uh, was that a good decision? Yes. Why? Because I had a baby, and I came home. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. So Diana, you're you're the reason. Yeah. She wants to know if you approve of her decision to quit teaching math. She's blaming it on you. Now she can play the organ. Yeah, so we are all blessed by that decision. So yeah, thank you, Cameron, very much. So it's an interesting thing how we very easily and often quit things because they are difficult or we get distracted or better opportunities come along. Um, And yet today, when we see a perfectly good opportunity for God to quit on us, for not following his rules and forgetting about him all over the place, yet again, he confirms his promise to us that he will never quit on us and he will always be by our side and he will always be working to bring us closer and closer to himself forever. Let's pray about it. Dear Jesus, Jesus. thank you for never quitting on me. me. Help me to always remember remember. you're right by my side. side. In your name, name. amen. Thanks, everybody. We continue with the hymn of the day. Please be seated. (laughs) 
Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Alyssa calls to me from another room, and the reason was there was water coming from under the refrigerator. Okay. Well, by the time I got there, she very dutifully had kind of soaked it up. It was gone. And so my response then was the very obvious, well, let's just see what happens. The, the proverbial, maybe it'll fix itself if we do nothing. It didn't. It didn't take very long for there to be more water. So then I uh, rolled up my sleeves, so to speak, pulled the refrigerator out. I took off some back panels as if I really knew what I was doing. And I start looking at some things and trying to figure out where it's leaking from, and I found a hose, and I was sure that was it. It, was, it looked very broken to me. It definitely needed to be changed. I found one online. I shut off the water line, ordered it a couple days later, put it in, fired it back up, felt very proud of myself until it leaked some more. <laughs> and then I did the very average normal thing. I gave up. I called an appliance repair man. He came. There's parts on the way even right now, and that's where we're at. I think that's a very us response, a very our society these days response. Is as soon as something just goes over that tipping point and is a little too hard, it's really easy to quit. As soon as there's more resistance than we were anticipating, it's easy to quit. And there's a lot of logic behind it and a lot of cheerleaders for quitting, other people that have quit things. They'll tell you, ah, oh, well, you tried. That's the phrase, you tried. Just quit. I think that is a major theme in our gospel lesson today. So our gospel lesson begins in kind of an unusual way. We have a parable in front of us, and the parable gives us its meaning, effectively the end at the beginning, to pray and not lose heart. That's how it starts. Now, there's only a couple of parables that do that, give us a meaning at the beginning, so start with the end. And so I think we've got to pay attention to this meaning. So pray and don't lose heart. Hang on to that. There's two main characters that Jesus uses in this parable, the story he tells. And let's start with the widow. There's a widow and a judge. The widow... She is in a bad spot. Being a widow in general in this part of the world during this time period was not an enviable position. There were not really any legal protections. There certainly was no such thing as a government assistance for a person in, in a difficult position like this. Um, she could not hold a job. She could not obviously support herself. It would be very difficult for her to maintain her house. It very likely, very logically, very often turned into a widow would have to turn to begging. Now, there was a certain set of legal protections that existed, set up by God's law, that required the closest related, either by blood or marriage, male family member to care for the widow and defend the widow. The problem is, in our text today, we find this widow, she is seeking justice for being wronged. And the fact that she is petitioning the court on her own tells us there's no one around to defend her. No one. Do you know what that means? That means that there is some guy somewhere whose job it is, whose legal requirement it is, to take care of her and defend her and invite her in, and make sure that she doesn't have to turn to begging on the streets to survive, and he's completely ignoring his role. So the widow in our text is abandoned and all alone, and she's up against incredible odds, especially for this. We're told that she wants justice against her adversary, and everything in the text tells us that her petition in the court is completely legitimate, that somehow she has been economically wronged. Someone has stolen from her, taken advantage of her, and she doesn't have a whole lot to give. She doesn't have a whole lot to begin with. 
She is in a terrible position, so she's completely at the mercy of this court petition. And that's the worst spot she could be, because the judge judge is the second person in this parable. If you petitioned the court for a person-to-person dispute uh, in Israel at this time, you would have a three-judge panel that would be in charge of hearing your case. Uh, one that the defendant would choose, one judge that the plaintiff would choose, and another one that a government authority would choose a representative. So either King Herod or uh, a Roman representative would be that third judge. And the third judge is what we're talking about in our text. And that third judge appointed by the government was notoriously corrupt. These court-appointed, government-appointed third judges were known by the people as robber judges. And there was a phrase they liked to say about them. They would completely ignore justice for a good piece of meat. That tells you the kind of people we're dealing with and the kind of court system we're dealing with. And so these judges were known to change up their docket ordering in favor of the more powerful and influential people that were making petitions. They were known to take bribes for judgments to go the way of the person that paid them. So to the highest bidder goes the verdict. And we have a completely broke and destitute widow who's making this petition before this judge. This is hopeless. There's no chance. There were plenty of people who were low on the social ladder at this time that never got their cases heard. There was just always someone who had a little bit more uh, influence, some leverage on the judge, a little bit more they could bribe the judge with. There was always someone that knocked them out. This happened all the time, all the time. And this woman is at the bottom. And she needs this to survive. It's all she's got. Now, I think we can pause for a moment and see ourselves in each of these two figures in this parable. Anytime you have ever felt that things were happening outside of your control to make it feel like the walls are closing in, and no one sees you, and no one understands you, and maybe no one cares. Maybe you feel all alone. Maybe you feel taken advantage of. Then you know what this widow feels like in this text. The judge, well, he is operating on one motivator, selfishness. He is a me, 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 I, I, I kind of guy. And I think, unfortunately, since we can find all of our sin rooted in selfishness, we see a little too much of ourselves in that judge. So any time that someone in the world, maybe you, covet or steal, well, that's deciding that the blessings you got from God are the wrong ones, and you shouldn't have to work for the other ones. You go take what you want. Anytime a person is gossiping, they've decided that their uh, standing in the social circle that they're in is more important than the reputation of the person they're talking about. Anytime that someone steps out on their marriage that adultery happens, they have decided that their momentary gratification is the most important thing above and beyond one of the most significant gifts that God has given them in a spouse. Anytime we dishonor authorities, we've decided we know best. Anytime we don't remember the Sabbath day, we have decided things that are more interesting or exciting to us than what happens in God's house on Sunday morning, that's what we should be doing. And we'll take care of that spiritual thing when there's nothing else going on. And you know what all that adds up to? The first commandment, having no other gods, we turn ourselves into our own idols. And before too long, we're a little bit like this judge. 
Our parable goes on. We're told that the widow does something completely illogical that we wouldn't expect. She keeps persisting in petitioning the court over and over and over. This completely corrupt, famously corrupt judge has brushed her off once, again, again, again. The verb actually tells us she did it over and over and over continually for an unspecified amount of time. That's the Greek verb we have there. And she never gives up. And what would, what, what would we say? What would the world say in a situation like that? You tried, right? Figure out another plan, move on, just quit. Just, just quit. This isn't going to go your way. You're never going to be important enough to him for him to even see, consider the merits of your case. Just quit. And yet she doesn't. The text tells us the judge says uh, that he is wanting to uh, not have her beat down on him, that she's been persisting so much. He wants to get rid of her because she's going to beat down on him. Literally, I love this, in, in the Greek it says he's afraid of getting a black eye from her. He's afraid she's going to beat him up. Isn't that neat? She's so persistent. He is worried about this coming to fists and her having nothing to lose. Love it. And so, he rules in her favor. And so, is he all of a sudden just? No. He ruled the, the correct way, but he did it for all the wrong reasons. He did it because he wanted her to go away. He wanted to get right back to me, 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 I, 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 good piece of meat, no more justice. He wanted to get back to his world. The text tells us that he neither feared God nor respected man. There was actually a, a Jewish description that they would use commonly to describe the worst kind of corrupt leaders. So this guy's the worst of the worst through and through. He's not just, he's just still selfish. So what do we do with this? Jesus tells us that your judge, that God, is going to bring justice for you speedily. Now, speedily, what's that look like to eternal God? I'll tell you. At this point in the Gospels, Jesus is just about to his destination of Jerusalem, where he's going to suffer and die. And so the always just God, I'm going to tell you how he brings justice for you. He takes all your selfishness and takes all of your sin, and by the way, a completely just and fair God takes your sin and sends you to hell. And he takes all of that, all of the, the wrath and the punishment for all of your sin and focuses it all on his innocent son. And justice is served for you. But here's the thing. When that happens. Your sin is removed and paid for. The justice has been served. God has called you by name and called you to himself. The crucified Son of God, Jesus, gives you faith to believe and enjoy and live in that promise. And all that's left is you and God and the faith that he gives to bind you together. And so, Jesus asked the question in our parable, will there be faith found on earth? And I think that answer is found in your heart. And so, if you've ever felt like the walls are caving in, and the unfairness of the world is taking advantage of you yet again, 
and you don't know if there's a way out, and you don't know if anyone cares, and you don't know if anyone sees you. God's answer to you today is that you are loved more than you could ever imagine. And that justice has been served for everything you've done wrong so that he can just draw you to himself in faith. If you've ever felt like you've lost your way in selfishness and sin, and you felt like you've gone too far, and who would forgive you and who would love you, and how is that even possible? It may be true that the logic of the world says when something is that messed up as your heart, throw it away and start over. God says the opposite. And so in a way that the world can't possibly understand, in a completely illogical way to us, the completely just and merciful and loving God calls you by name as his own. And his son dies for you and he plants faith in your heart. And that promise means that you've done nothing, and yet every good thing is yours in Jesus. So, pray and don't lose heart. For Jesus has overcome the world for you, and God's love is greater and deeper than you could ever imagine. And you're never alone. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which certainly surpasses understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ to life everlasting. Amen. Please stand. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. For the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of all the gospel and calling of all to faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. For those who labor, for those who work and in danger, and for all who travel, and for our service members, Scott, Kevin, Rachel, Josh, Michelle, Scott, Thomas, Nick, Andrew, Jim, Tim, James, Jonathan, Paul, Stephen, Randall, Chris, Stephen, Effen, Laith. Connor, Paul, Nathan, and Adam, let us pray to the Lord. For those in need, for the hungry, the homeless, the widowed, and the orphan, and for those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and the dying, and for those who care for them, to include Barb and Deborah, let us pray to the Lord. Lord we pray for the Grace Renovation Project, people of Ukraine, the sympathy for the friends and family of our dear friend Sam Miller, Bob Darden, 
and Merrill Murray. And for all those who need its comfort, let us pray to the Lord. Finally, for those and for all of our needs, of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Please be seated. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Now may this true body and true blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you steadfast in the one true faith to life everlasting. To part in his peace and joy. Amen. Let us pray. O God, the Father, fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Now go in peace, serve the Lord.